Well, good morning. Good to be with you today. Glad that you can be here with us, uh, many of us in person and many more uh, online. Uh, so glad to be with you today. It's a beautiful day in the Yakima Valley. God is with us. He has been uh, caring for us and supporting us over this past year. Uh, COVID has been with us in the state of Washington for over a year now. And uh, God help us. We're ready for it to be done. May he um, bless us with the eradication of this disease, or at least its diminishment, so we don't have to be afraid. So grateful that we can restart Children's Church. I noticed a few families who were able to come uh, today who had not been able to come before. We're very glad uh, to be able to reopen Children's Church, and we're hoping to uh, be able to continue uh, to get back to a fuller experience of church life uh, as the virus, Lord willing, diminishes. Uh, we're not going to rush that. We want to be smart and safe about it, but, um, but we pray that God would speed uh, that uh, restoration of just normal church life. One other thing uh, we didn't think to mention it earlier, time change is next Sunday, so remember to reset your clocks next Saturday night, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, that way you'll be here on time uh, next week. If we could portray faith in a picture, what would faith look like? Does faith look like wearing a Christian t-shirt? Does faith look like putting crosses on the wall? Or maybe putting pictures of angels or of Jesus up on your wall? Does faith look like a stained glass window? Does it look like people sitting in a church service on Sunday morning when all their neighbors are sleeping in or have disappeared into the mountains for a weekend of adventures? Does faith look like a made-for-TV preacher offering a passionate appeal, preferably in a southern accent, for you to open your heart and let the Lord Jesus come in? Is that what faith looks like? <laughs> Does faith look like getting down on your knees to pray? Does faith look like holding a child or sitting with an aged woman or man? Does faith look like reading a Bible? Does it look like a person being dipped underwater and raised back up? What does faith look like? Well, none of these pictures by itself is faith. Not one of them. Not by itself. An atheist can read the Bible and still not believe. You can go to church every Sunday of your life and still never follow Jesus. Anybody can wear a Christian t-shirt without necessarily living what the shirt claims. You can even get down on your knees and pray and still not submit to the will of God. What does real faith look like? Well, real faith sometimes takes odd shapes. Today, as we're continuing in the book of Luke, we'll look at a few stories of the odd shapes of faith. Five stories all told by Luke, all in a row, as if to invite us to look at them all together and think about what real faith looks like. And, you know, it looks pretty odd sometimes. It's just not what you would normally expect in some cases. It certainly is more than wearing a Christian t-shirt or sitting in a pew. So five stories from the book of Luke about faith. Let's think through them one at a time. Let's begin in Luke 18, verse 15, with the parents. Luke 18, 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never 
enter it. What a strange demonstration of faith. These parents, I'm going to call them parents, I'm guessing they were parents, but there may have been more than just parents, maybe grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, close friends, neighbors, who brought the little children to Jesus. These, I'm going to call them parents. These parents demonstrate their faith by bringing babies to Jesus. They believe Jesus can impart a blessing to their little ones, so they want Jesus to place his hands on them. Some of you did something similar today. You brought your little ones or your not-so-little ones to come and be in the presence of Jesus and receive some kind of blessing from him today. The disciples do not see the parents' action here as faith, but maybe as a distraction or maybe even a dishonor to Jesus. And so they try to stop the parents. They rebuke them. But in the parents' action, Jesus sees faith. So he rebukes his disciples. He welcomes the children. He teaches his disciples to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. These parents had faith. It looks a little odd, but it's definitely faith. Sometimes faith can look like parents bringing their little ones to Jesus. The next story, Luke 18, verse 18, the rich ruler. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. The rich ruler. This is a more typical demonstration of faith, but then it doesn't end so well. The rich ruler shows his faith by coming to Jesus and asking what God wants him to do. What must he do to get eternal life? Sometimes faith looks like simply coming to Jesus and asking, what does God want me to do? And this man, from all appearances, has been faithful. He has kept God's commandments. He probably thinks he's lived out his faith very well. But when Jesus presses the issue, something's not right. This man has faith, but his faith lacks one thing. To fill that lack... Jesus tells him to go, sell everything he has, give to the poor, and then come follow him. And the man can't do it. He's very rich, and he can't part with his wealth. So when it comes to following God, does this rich ruler really have faith in God, or is his faith in something else? Having faith in God means both believing God and trusting God. 
to the point that nothing stands between you and God anymore. But you can give God anything. And this man, he believed in God. But he just couldn't give up his wealth. Not even for God. He lacked that full commitment to trust God wherever God would send him, whatever the cost. As Jesus points out, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's just so hard to put your trust in God and not in money. But then in contrast, there are Jesus' apostles. As Peter speaks on their behalf. He says to Jesus, we have left all we had to follow you. The rich man couldn't give up everything for God. But Peter and the other apostles already had. And Jesus commends anyone who ever leaves anything, even home or family, for the kingdom of God. That's faith. When you put God before everything else in your life. When you give up something for the sake of the kingdom of God, something important to you, something, anything, everything, that's real faith. This was faith in an odd shape when Jesus' disciples left everything they had to follow him. The third story, Jesus predicting his suffering, verse 31. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Well, this isn't really a story of faith, so let's set this one aside for the moment, and we'll come back to it later. Here, Jesus just tells his apostles what's going to happen to him when they get to Jerusalem. It's a prophecy. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. He will be mocked, insulted, spat upon, flogged, and killed. But then he will rise again, and the prophecy doesn't make any sense to his disciples. They don't know what will happen in days to come. It doesn't make sense to them. We'll come back to this prophecy of Jesus in a few minutes. Our fourth story, the blind beggar, verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. What a bold and surprising shape this blind man's faith took. How did he demonstrate his faith? He cried out to Jesus for mercy. He cried out to him. He lived in Jericho, only about 17, 18 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, was coming by Jericho. The blind man heard about it. And when he found that Jesus was near, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Again and again he cried out, son of David, have mercy on me. And he would not stop. He refused to be quiet when the people tried to make him stop. And Jesus heard him. And Jesus did what the man asked of him. He showed him mercy by restoring his sight to him. And Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Sometimes faith looks like 
coming to Jesus and crying out to him for mercy, believing he will help you and refusing to be silent until he does. This blind man had better eyes to see Jesus than a lot of sighted people had. He had eyes of faith. So he refused to let anyone stop him for, from crying out to Jesus for mercy. And then when he received his sight, he did even better. He followed Jesus, praising God. He wasn't one of those people who runs to God for help and then gets his help and then goes away and, and forgets about God. No, he, he received God's help and he followed Jesus to, to get God's help and then just forget about God. It's not faith. That's just selfishness. But this man, now able to see, followed Jesus, praising God. His faith was real, and he proved it first by calling out to Jesus, and then again when he followed Jesus. Our fifth story, the final story. Luke 19, verse 1. Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost, uh, to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus' faith comes in an odd shape indeed. At least it begins oddly. But then it finishes beautifully. First, he climbs a tree hoping to see Jesus. That's an unusual demonstration of faith. He's interested in Jesus, which might be just a sprouting of faith, a curiosity, wanting to know who this Jesus is and whether he really is from God. Zacchaeus was a man of poor reputation, a chief tax collector. If tax collectors were known for cheating others by charging more than was required in taxes and making themselves rich off the extra, then Zacchaeus was the worst of the worst not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector, and probably very wealthy because of it. Zacchaeus climbs a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus as he passes by. And then Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. And he probably spends some time teaching Zacchaeus there, because the next thing we see is Zacchaeus standing up in front of Jesus and whoever else is present and promising Jesus that he will give half of his possessions to the poor and pay back anyone he's cheated four times the amount he took from them. And Jesus declares that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. So Zacchaeus shows his faith by turning away from the sin in his life and committing himself to God. And he shows his commitment by giving generously to the poor and making right the wrongs that he's done to others. Sometimes, often, faith looks like repentance. Turning away from sin, making it right wherever we can, recommitting ourselves to God, sharing what we have with others. Zacchaeus proved himself to be a man of sincere faith. In fact, he's the opposite of that other rich man we read about a minute ago, the one who couldn't give up his wealth. The rich ruler couldn't let it go, but Zacchaeus gladly gives it away in order to be the man God wants him 
to be. So what we learn from the people in these stories, the parents, the rich ruler, Jesus' disciples, the blind man, Zacchaeus, is that faith takes many different forms. It comes in all kinds of odd shapes. Sometimes it looks like bringing babies to Jesus. Sometimes it looks like asking what God wants you to do to get eternal life. Sometimes it looks like giving up something, anything, everything for the kingdom of God. Sometimes it looks like crying out to the Lord for mercy and refusing to be silenced until he helps you. Sometimes it looks like turning away from sin and doing what God wants you to do. The people in these stories demonstrate their faith in very different ways, but they all live out their faith. Well, all except for the rich ruler who falters when faith becomes too costly. These people all lived out their faith in different ways, but they all had two traits in common, two traits that show us what real faith always looks like. The first trait they shared, they all humble themselves before God. They all humble themselves before God. The parents humbly and hopefully, uh, even receiving shame from the disciples who rebuked them at first, bring their children to Jesus. The disciples submit everything they have to God as they leave everything behind to follow Jesus. They humble themselves and follow Jesus. The blind man has no pride at all. He just cries out desperately for mercy from Jesus. Zacchaeus, wealthy and powerful, with every reason to be proud, climbs a tree so that he can see Jesus and then stands up and publicly changes his life in order to do the will of God. They all humble themselves before God. Faith requires humility. Because if we're going to walk with God, we have to be humble. Uh, we have to humble ourselves and let him lead. It's not enough to wear a cross around your neck if you don't also live the submission to God that the cross represents. It does no good to sit on a pew every Sunday if you're not there for the purpose of honoring God and seeking his will. Faith requires humility before God. The second trait that all of these faithful people shared is that they all pursued or followed Jesus. They all pursued or followed Jesus. The parents came to Jesus. They pursued him to have him place his hands on their babies. The rich ruler came seeking Jesus' teaching, though, unfortunately, he didn't follow it. Peter and the other apostles left all they had to follow Jesus. The blind man pursued Jesus with his voice, and then when Jesus healed him, he followed Jesus with his feet and with his heart. Zacchaeus climbed a tree just to get a glimpse of of Jesus, then welcomed Jesus in, into his home, then turned his life around in obedience to the will of God. He demonstrated by his actions that he followed Jesus. Faith requires pursuit of Jesus, first to come to him, then to follow him. It's not enough to be baptized in Jesus' name, to be immersed down into the water and then brought back up if once you've dried off, you don't continue to follow him by the way you live. Surrounding yourself with stained glass windows or covering your body with Christian apparel changes nothing about who you are on the inside. To live in faith, we have to enter into a new relationship with God and then follow Jesus diligently, seeking God's will and doing it the best we can. And that's where the rich ruler stumbled. His faith took him far enough to ask Jesus what he needed to do to get eternal life, but not far enough to do it. And this is where that other little story, the one we sort of skipped over, that's tucked in the middle of all these pictures of faith we've looked at, 
becomes so important for us today. That little story of Jesus prophesying to his 12 apostles that when they get to Jerusalem, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, mocked, insulted, spat upon, flogged, and then killed. But then he will rise again. The prophecy doesn't make any sense to his apostles, but when Jesus' suffering and crucifixion come about, then they will have to decide whether they still have faith to follow a man who is treated so terribly, knowing that they could be treated the same way. They would have to decide whether they would follow Jesus no matter what the cost. And that's what faith looks like in all its odd shapes. It always looks like the decision to humble ourselves and follow Jesus, whatever the cost. Believing and trusting. Believing that God is with us on this journey and trusting that in the end he will do for us what he did for Jesus. That he will raise us from the dead and give us eternal life. So crosses on the wall or hanging around your neck are good. Wearing a Christian t-shirt is fine. Coming to worship on Sunday is obviously pleasing to God. And I personally enjoy the beauty of a well-crafted stained glass window and am very grateful for an encouraging or challenging message from God's Word delivered in a beautiful southern accent. But the faith that pleases God and leads us to eternal life looks like this. We humble ourselves to seek God and to learn His will. And we pursue Jesus and follow Him, whatever the cost, wherever He will lead us, giving everything to do God's will. This is what real faith in all its odd shapes looks like. May God bless us with real faith. May He bless you today. Let's pray. God, our Father, as we have read this uh, section of Scripture and considered these people who demonstrated their faith in this variety of ways, as we have thought about the humility that faith requires and the pursuit of Jesus, the, the, the commitment to follow Jesus that faith requires, Lord, we pray that you would grant us real faith. Help us to grow in humility before you, knowing that you are good, that you care for us, and that we can trust you. Help us, Lord, to grow in the, our commitment to follow Jesus wherever he will lead us. Help us not to be afraid. Help us not to uh, hesitate to give up whatever we need to give up to follow you. But Lord, help us to be like the parents who brought their babies to Jesus. Help us to be like the disciples who left everything to follow Jesus. Help us to be like the blind man, crying out for your help when we need it, and then thanking you and, and following you when you grant our request. Help us to be like Zacchaeus, who was not ashamed to climb up in that tree so he could see Jesus, who was not ashamed to stand before Jesus and recommit himself to God. Lord, help us to have the courage to follow Jesus even to the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his great love. Thank you for his absolute commitment to you to do your will, which has brought about our salvation. Lord, bless us today. Bless your church. Renew our faith. Lord, do not let the restrictions that we're under discourage us, but rather, uh, Lord, open our minds and our hearts to you for your direction, uh, that we may do what is good in your eyes. Bless our leaders. Dear Lord, bless our congregation. Help us in the days ahead. We put our faith in you again today, Lord. We love you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.